with respect to biography or serious nonfiction or even of advances. I think that we've just worked consistently through this and I would hope that um, everyone else's experience sort of reflects this. Since our time is limited, I will say that um, I, I think it's been wonderful for reading and readers, and I think it will be even better for libraries and things like that. I hope everybody else's experience is similar. I look forward to hearing what you have to say, um, Gail and um, Anne. Catherine. Yeah. Catherine, I'm sorry. That's okay, me. yeah. Well, that, well, that's encouraging that you're optimistic. Um, Gail, do you... Sure. Uh, uh, sort of share you know, the three of us are very lucky in that we do, I like to think, books that uh, affect the culture and, and change the world a little bit. So I, I too am working my butt off, but also uh, having a lot of, I hope, impact and seeing, I have two books on the New York Times bestseller list this week, so I'm a happy camper. <laughs> you know, we're also been in the business long enough to, you know, have authors that that are important and that I think one of the things we're seeing is that the publishers are work to my mind they're actually working more effectively than I would have ever imagined I always used to joke that the phrase publishing business was an oxymoron but it seems to have been less affected than many industries and um, and you know it's responding to the time slowly but we always think that we're there to uh, work on books that deal with topics of, of some urgency, even when it's history and biography, that they have a relevance today that, that, that we can find and that we can use to market. And the, you know, there are people coming out every day to, to, be on, to listen to panels such as this one, where authors are talking in ways that it's much easier to get somebody to attend a, a talk like this than to come out at lunchtime or come out at eight o'clock at night for different events. So there are real opportunities and um, I feel very lucky and happy to be in this world and there's still a lot of work to do, but Yeah, I mean, I, I found that um, the, the sort of urgency of the moment in many ways is good for serious nonfiction. I mean, there's, I've had a couple of really big sales as have my colleagues, um, which by the way, was not happening in March and April for us at least, but, um, but since then, you know, once people um, kind of got their feet under them and their laptop set up at home, um, you know, the, the, the publishing business is up and running quite effectively and buying big books on, you know, working parenthood, remote work, the future of work, racial justice, um, uh, the history of race in America, uh, science, medicine. I mean, there's just a lot of really important subjects that people care about right now in the publishing industry and in the larger reader community. And, um, and if you're an agent of serious nonfiction, you can really benefit from that. So I, I actually have felt, you know, in the last two months or so, pretty positive about where we are. There's also, there've been some exciting developments in sort of the book selling world. Um, Bookshop.org is a, is a website that is a consortium of independent, or it's a, it, it sells on behalf of independent bookstores. Um, it's certainly not a competitor of Amazon that's, you know, in any big, serious, muscular way, but it's, um, but it's out there. People, people in my life who don't work in publishing know about it and are buying books there and instead of Amazon. So just you know, to give Amazon a little competition and give indie bookstores some help in this moment is really terrific. And it's and it's happening. Um, and uh, and then I know that you know a lot of events have moved from um, the in-person bookstore kinds of events to uh, virtual events and. That was a really painful shift for a lot of bookstores, but um, I, uh, I know the owner of the Harvard Bookstore, which is near me here, here in Cambridge, and, um, and he's able to have way more people attend events for the same reason you described, Gail, people can attend this event and other bio panels from all over the world in all time zones um, uh, on their own schedule. And, um, and that has been really great for event attendance for books. Um, and on the sort of more commercial side, the those bookstores can um, 
collect information, they can collect the emails and so forth of their of the attendees and and have a more robust way of reaching people all over the world in the future. So, you know, it's the, the first couple of months of the pandemic were really strange and and difficult. Um, and I think things have shifted and there are lots of reasons to feel good about serious nonfiction and about some of the things happening in, in book selling. I mean, it's not, a, if I may just say one more thing, it's not a completely rosy picture. I mean, we're still trying to figure out a lot of independents are, are truly suffering, independent bookstores, and also what, what they're just beginning to get a, a grasp on is what they call the conversion rate. You know, a books in-house bookstore event, the conversion rate for uh, that is of people who attend and buy the book um, is fairly high in most places or most uh, major uh, independent bookstores. The conversion rate on these, um, on these virtual events is, is not anywhere near as high for most books. And that's something we're, that the bookstores are trying to get their hands around there. Some of them are experimenting with requiring you to buy the book before you attend an event. Others are asking, you know, outright for donations um, if you already have the book, for example. So it, the, I think the independent bookstores are a work in progress in terms of dealing with this crisis. Have you found also, I've found that the authors are getting a lot more creative in terms of virtual events. Yes. Doing their own event like this, for example, or others where they have, they're in conversation with people who are, let's say, on a similar vein, in a similar vein, and um, they've just, they've adapted to the environment to promote and produce events for themselves. I mean, a little bit hesitantly at first, but they're getting there. With respect to something else you said, Kay, and I think it's also true that doing, and Catherine said as well, is doing the serious nonfiction. One of the things I've found is that books that we published 25 years ago are making their way back and are on the bestseller list of the Times and the Post now as we speak. And we never, I mean, of course we thought the books would have you know, life, but we didn't think that they'd have this sort of resurgence at this point. That's absolutely so, right. I'd say get creative in terms of virtual events and selling books. And I think it's going to prolong the life of books, especially okay. serious nonfiction. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I see happening is, uh, is institutions besides, in addition to bookstores, who a uh, Brookings or some sort of other um, uh, yeah a trade association or organization that has like like this one today that has its own interested group of people that want information uh, i think and i think this will continue after the pandemic they are to to do these things virtually because you do get more people and you don't have to go across the street or you don't have to go across town to sit and have lunch, you just get to learn and you get to serve your members if you're a member organization or an organization with some sort of constituency. So that's one good thing. I think those events, and for, for several of my clients, those events have been as robust and resulted in bookstore book sales in addition to bookstore sales. So that's great. So it, it sounds, sounds like all three of you um, feel like the industry is sort of moving ahead fairly normally right now. Maybe it wasn't at first, um, but things have kind of settled down. And I'm wondering, I spoke with an agent recently who told me that he's telling his writers to kind of hold off on uh, trying to sell books. And he's basically told them, you know, wait till January and we'll see how things are. And I'm wondering if that's something, you know, what thoughts you all have about that? Are you telling clients to kind of wait on new proposals, Faith? I was really quite surprised to see that. I mean, and I know everyone's experience, just like everyone's process, every writer's process is different. Perhaps for every agent it's different, but as I said, things could not be better for us as we speak and have been since I'd say about February, things have been really good. And I think that if you're ready with a project, I would not hold back not to contradict his advice, I'm just saying I would not advise a client to wait. There may be topical reasons for a particular thing to wait, but we're doing, you know, we're doing a very good business. Um, and I think that people want and need 
to see material now. I mean, I've got editors calling out of the blue asking for stuff. Perhaps that's your experience too. The other two agents, that's your experience too. I wouldn't wait. I would go if it's ready now. Well, I don't think there's any reason to suspect that January is going to be that much different. I think that's just a failure of imagination, perhaps, and yeah. and, and maybe some concern about the project itself. And that's a whole other story. If your, agent, <laughs> if your agent's telling you that, then maybe you need to dig below that, I think, and 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 understand why that is. Yeah, I would say, you know, I... I'm actually rushing out some projects that I think have particular, um, you know, ur urgency to continue to use that word in, in this moment um, to really uh, help editors connect my project to this moment um, and to be and to be one of the early books through the door on the subject, um, you know, whether it's a racial justice subject or a coronavirus subject. Um, but uh, but I would say, you know, I, I might not send something out right around the presidential election. Right. Um, though, you know, in the past, that was because people were really distracted with their regular lives, plus watching, you know, CNN. Now, I don't know, no one's really distracted with knocking on doors, I suppose. Um, so, um, so I, you know, I actually feel like there's sort of more room to send things out in the fall. Um, and and I, I wouldn't wait for January either. I, I also wonder if it's a little hesitation about the project itself. Yeah. Okay, that's, well, that's super helpful. Um, so I know that we, biographers tend to take a pretty long time to develop their topics, okay? And I know we have a lot of people out there because I've been getting this question who, you know, their topic doesn't exactly relate to our contemporary moment. Um, it doesn't have any sort of political or medical angle. I mean, you, you all have kind of brought up the, the relevancy question. What, what's the biographer to do when their topic suddenly doesn't seem super relevant or is maybe even something that is, um, maybe it's a figure who's fairly conventional and conservative. Um, I think we, we had a question about, I'm trying to remember the specifics here, but uh, somebody who's writing a history of an Anglo-Irish landowning family, you know, a kind of more conservative, you know, family. So do you have any thoughts about um, people who are sort of feeling like their topic is suddenly not at all relevant? I'll start. I mean, my feeling is that um, biography, serious nonfiction, a lot of it is really context and it's the writing and it's how good the proposal is, how passionate the person is and how good the research is. That's really what carries the project over. So whether it's an Anglo-Irish family or, you know, the mysterious Hercules Seggers, it doesn't, it's really in the execution and the passion that the writer brings to it. I think with biography, history, serious nonfiction, it also has something to do with setting the context. If you can make it readable and relatable, and at the same time have a story that sort of moves people, that's really, that's the point, you know? I don't, I, I don't think that it's just pure selling into relevancy, you know? Right. Some of the best biographies are sort of collective biographies. I mean, it's all sorts of things that are that are, that uh, that persuade an editor to buy a book, and it's not just something that matches the moment. I think it's much deeper than that. You know. You know, I, I think that um, with biography and history, it's always a question of whether it. You know, if it's someone who's been been talked about a lot, then you have to find that new angle. And if it's someone um, who is fairly unknown, then you have to, the pressure is on the new research and, and the writing. I mean, people, people, my theory is that people buy books for two reasons. They buy books to become smarter about something they need to be smarter about, or to escape their lives and be inspired or just to get out of their heads. That's why memoir works because someone's life is more screwed up than yours and it makes you feel better perhaps. But good biography, good history should reach both those needs. 
And so if you make someone smarter about something that, that they feel good being smarter about or need to be smarter about, and then you know, take them to a different world through your storytelling and your character development, um, that's what could be better. And that can work anytime if it's, if it's done right. Yes, I agree. You can, I mean, that's a, the sort of process of transporting a reader can certainly be done with the subject you use as an example here. I, I think that's a world that the, you know, modern American doesn't know a lot about. And if you can transport us there and make us understand why it's atmospheric and interesting and dramatic um, and significant, then, then it's a saleable project. And then write it well, <laughs> it's a saleable project. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Those were great answers. Thank you all so much. Um, I've been taking notes, it's been great. So in what ways do you see the industry industry right now responding to the Black Lives Matter movement? Or do you see this as, as a long-term uh, response or is it just, you know, something that's come up recently and may fade again? Um, you know, what are your thoughts about that particular part of our historical moment? Are we sticking to our order? Faith, are you first? Or? Are you pleased? Hold forth. Hold forth. Well, you know, this is, it is a huge problem, you know, for, for, I mean, I've been in this business over 30 years and, and I just, I just sold a book for a, a wonderful uh, man who kept saying, uh, looking at the list and we were talking to, I think, 20 different publishers and he, and, and there were so few black faces looking back at him on the Zooms during these interviews that, you know, he would say, oh, and that's the one that had two, and this was a black man, right? And so, I mean, it's a, it's a real problem, the representation in, in our business. And that's got to change. And I'm hoping that some of what's going on right now um, is more than lip service and that will uh, respond to a, an obvious, obvious problem. Um, in terms of, um, in, you know, and, the, and there's, there seems to be an urgency and every publisher is, is coming up with these task forces and, and there have been some, you know, there have been some really uh, impressive hirings in the last month uh, to, you know, to run the Simon & Schuster imprint at Simon & Schuster and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and someone new at Pantheon and I mean, it's just, there's stuff happening, but what, I'm in a wait and see. Um, but in terms of the books themselves, I think that publishing business is responding to the moment in a good way. And they're, and, and they're seeing as Faith said, look at these books. If you look at the bestseller list now, um, it's many, many books that deal with topics of interest um, in, in this moment. And so I, I don't know, Faith, I'm really interested in what you have to say about this. Um. I think we've seen moments like this before in publishing. Um, and I think that indeed the hiring of Dana Kennedy at Simon & Schuster and Lisa Lucas at Pantheon are welcome developments, parallel hires that don't address issues of, um, you know, internships or the pipeline or getting more editorial assistance and training programs because it takes years, as you know, to sort of achieve a sort of critical mass of senior editors and that sort of thing. And, and, and publishing houses do hire from outside when they want to. So yes, it's unprecedented. I think it's unprecedented certainly for people of color and the representation at the top in the industry is wanting, shall we say. I think that's been documented sort of with empirical evidence, the Lee and Lowe study is one thing. But I think also um, it's the follow through that matters. Um, and I would also say that, you know, it's a bit like having cousins marry, you know, it, it helps to have a diversity of opinion, you know, then you can sort of, it makes a difference in terms of what the output is going to be. Um, and I think it's, a, I'm taking a wait and see approach to see where people end up and, um, a corrective is certainly in order and we shall see what happens. I am a little, um, you know, I think that sort of this, this rush to buy projects now to fit into the moment 
um, runs against the impulse of people who sell serious nonfiction, biography, et cetera, projects that are years in the making and that require research and conscious effort and, you know, thought, thoughtfulness. So, on ne sait jamais, you know, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And I, and I also hope that February next year isn't crowded with a bunch of, you know, books that are sort of discardable and then we're on to a new moment, mm -hmm. you know, that's, so I am cautious. I'm optimistic, yes, but cautious. One, um, one uh, sort of mini trend in publishing recently that has made me, um, as a cautious person, optimistic, um, is uh, there's been this um, Twitter hashtag uh, publishing paid me, um, and it has, uh, and, and, and many writers have contributed, actually some of you maybe on this, um, call have contributed information about how much they were paid, uh, a book, uh, what their book advance was. Um, uh, and, um, and the idea behind it is to be transparent about what authors get paid. Um, and, uh, and, there's, and there's some pretty shocking differences between a lot of white writers and black writers. Um, and, uh, and I had sort of like vaguely followed that. And then um, one of my authors, a black sociologist, we were about to, we were getting ready to send out her project to publishers. And she asked me about that and said, I want to think about how to make sure that, you know, um, I get paid what I should. And we really had like a good, interesting conversation about that. And she was really educated and aware of the difference in um, in what uh, black writers and white writers can be paid. And I just thought, I thought, well, if this is the direction that we're going in where um, writers are really savvy about this and there's a lot more transparency in the industry, we're going in the right direction. So that is a, is a moment that has made me hopeful. I, I think this takes us back to something else and it underscores the importance of having people in the industry who understand and value a particular kind of culture. I am reminded that years ago, um, we circulated a biography of Ella Baker and no one knew who Ella Baker was. And, um, That's sad. <laughs> no one knew who she was. Um, and um, the, the education process was so uphill, I mean, downright Sisyphean, to, 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 um, to tell people who Ella Baker was about the Freedom School, about her relation to SNCC and other things. And it was contextual as well, because the biography dealt with the role of women, which was significant and seminal in the entire sort of civil rights movement. Women, particularly African-American women, teachers, women, I mean, they ran practically every institution and got little credit for it, as we saw later in, in accounts like Taylor Branch and others. I think that goes to your point, Catherine, as well, and to the point of people who are doing this publishing paid me, that it's important to have people who understand not just who someone is or what institution they're working for at this moment, but to also value the larger culture, okay? And to understand sort of the context into which something is published. Yeah, so I, I know we have some um, of our biographers who are concerned about particularly, you know, with these concerns being so uh, prevalent in our society now in terms of you know, thinking about context. Um, do you have any thoughts or advice for people, uh, white biographers who are writing about black subjects? Because um, I know we have some people in that boat. I would say four uh, words. David Blight, Frederick Douglass. Do you? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, or you know, Taylor Branch and Civil Rights Movement. Civil Rights Movement. I mean, you got to have the goods. You got to have the 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 focus. You have to have the respect for the material, and you have to have other people support. The, you know, other people say that this is extraordinary work. It needs to be published. Yeah, make it make it really good, and 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 be upfront about your identity and how it relates to the subject matter. And we know that we will be truly free when black writers are able to white, write about white writers, especially white writers of significance, with a certain freedom and be well paid for it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay. So. 
uh, there's a lot of questions that are coming up in the chat, but I did want to make sure I asked one of these other big picture questions. Um, do you see any trends in biography, history, nonfiction, uh, narrative? Um, are there, do we see, are we seeing a shift perhaps towards writing about lesser known subjects or do you still see a pretty healthy market for writing about conventional subjects, i.e., you know, famous white men, I guess. Who wants to go first on that one? Gail? I haven't done it yet. Um, okay, 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 good. I, uh, I, I think it's harder now, uh, you know, the sort of, um, great man history found, you know, founding era father stuff, just like straight on. Um, there are wonderful books that do that. Um, but I think those are harder to sell now. And I'm fine with that. Um, that there are lots of people doing really interesting things with, um, with say that kind of history. Um, you know, Alexis Coe is a wonderful example of that. Um, she wrote a book about George Washington, a biography of George Washington, um, but it's titled, You Never Forget Your First. Um, and um, and it, uh, it incorporates humor, it incorporates um, some revisionist history. It just, you know, it's, um, she's a serious historian, but it's, um, it just has a very modern sensibility and um and it's written by a woman and um and it and it and it looks at uh sort of great man history um with a sort of side eye um and i and i think that's a wonderful development it just allows for a lot more interesting and diverse thinking about um people we've read a lot about uh so you know that so i i think there's um there are ways to write about very sort of traditional subjects in non-traditional ways. That's that's one avenue to um, to 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 being able to write about people that we all still want to know a lot about. Yeah, if I can just add real quickly, I know there's a new book. Um, Michael Gore has written a new book about William Faulkner. And that's our that's our agency's book. Yeah, uh -huh. it's a beautiful book. I read that book. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't wait to read it. But I, it, I hope he wins all the prizes in the world for that book. Yeah, it's it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Oh, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. And I know that the, what's interesting, I think, is that he's taking a very unconventional view in the sense that he's asking, you know, should we still read Faulkner? What does he have to tell us about race? And he's, so he's really approaching it, I guess, from a more contemporary point of view. And, but he's been working on it for years. Yeah. <laughs> of course, right? Many, many years. Yeah. Um, did you, Faith and Gail, want to add anything else before we move on to another question? Um, I'm going to say very quickly, oh, I'm sorry, Gail, if you'd like to go. Well, I was just going to say this idea of unconventional or, or interesting or unique prism is something that I think comes up uh, for me a lot in looking at serious nonfiction today is not just what are you bringing to it, I mean all this extraordinary research or whatever, but maybe a, a new way in and and then, you know, because that, not, I always say that people um, look at a book um, through a, you know, a pair of glasses and if you set up the glasses with a new, you know, a new way of questioning uh, the current thought about this person or a better way to read about it. I just sold a book for Steve Inskeep who is looking, can you imagine another book about Lincoln, right? But how do you possibly do another book about Lincoln? And he's, first of all, he's going to do this, the, a short 70,000 words and he's just picking what will turn out to be 14 or 15 people who actually faced Lincoln face to face at some point in his life and tell the story, it's called Facing Lincoln. Now, you know, it, but that to me encompasses a unique way in to a very tall, you know, very storied traditional white man, but, um, but it, it's, it's going to be back to what I said before, you're gonna learn a lot from it, but you're also gonna be delighted by uh, the words on the page and, and today the brevity of the approach, but some, you know, I, Kai Bird, who intro has introduced me to this group and who runs the biographers uh, project at, at uh, CUNY, you know, he's doing Jimmy Carter. And so is um, Jonathan Alter. And, you know, but, but he has a lot of very different things to say about Jimmy Carter. So it's that, 
it's that different prism or that different pair of glasses that you can bring no matter what kind of author you are or no matter what your subject is. I, or at least that's what I look for, the special sauce, the special ingredient. What about everything that's been said to Jade and I'm certainly looking forward to Annette Gordon Reed's biography of Thomas Jefferson, which will be informed by her erudition, but also her, um, her legal training. Yes. Which is an interesting way of looking at a figure from that century. Um, I, I think it's high time that we've had, that we get also reappraisals of people like Jimmy Carter, who are completely underestimated and almost forgotten in some yeah. senses. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think that there is any formula. I think we go back to what we talked about at the top, which is the structure and the, the passion and the approach that you bring to whoever the subject is. That's really what's definitive here, not um, is it chic, is it contemporary, that sort of thing. It's, it's the passion and the questions that you're asking and the research that you do and telling a convincing story. So I know that those of us who write about lesser known figures, um, we often get the response that there's not enough of an audience out there and there feels like an uphill battle. But then we've also seen the success you know, of books like Hidden Figures and just a bunch that have come after that. Um, what would you recommend for people? I mean, how can they make uh, the case that there is a wide readership out there for um, a book about lesser, a lesser known figure or group? I would say do the best proposal. <laughs> and I would also suggest that you um, tell a contextual story so that you you frame your story of the lesser known figure in events that the person may have, um, may have influenced other people who were, I mean, this is in part the strategy of Washington in um, the boss of the grips. Okay, you may be a red cap at Grand Central Station, but you're also a labor leader and you're a cultural and social phenomenon in a part of the city where there is a sort of nascent um, civil rights movement happening. So you, you connect the figure to lots larger social and institutional forces and I think that makes you know a, a grander more um, fully realized uh, fully realized work. I think also though this goes back to just telling a good story, putting the story together in the same way that you would for somebody who's very significant and doing a lot of, you know, digging around in the archives, the letters, the family members, all those things. I think that all makes a difference. I mean, this is not a new question. I mean, in the sense that for all of us, we always have to decide whether a particular biography um, is something that we can sell to the audience that the biographer wants, right? And, and that's, that's a question of topic and timing and the success of the proposal and the storytelling and all the, and the context. Is, Faith is saying, but there's sometimes are topics that are definitely worthy of time and energy and, and a book, but may not be a book of interest to Random House or Simon and Schuster or the other. And then and they there are other worthy homes for these places as well. That's just a very personal decision. If you have a if you if you wind up in a situation where you need more money than than a university press or the like then sometimes you have to choose a different topic. <laughs> there is that reality sometimes. Unfortunately, I, I remember speaking at the American Associate, History Association some years ago and, and you know, journalist clients of mine who are biographers, um, you know, they're, they're very jealous of the people who teach full-time in universities because they have, um, they get paid they have research assistants, they have access to all sorts of archives and the, and the rest, and they can therefore afford to write a, a book that's not as popular, perhaps not as popular as someone who's a, you know, a full-time biographer who came out of it from a, a journalism space or just not, not a, a tenured academic in a university. So it just really, you can't force something you can just uh, push as hard as you can. <laughs> right. And they sometimes don't know that it's a book they've been waiting for. 
right. witness, you know, Carrie Greenwich's life of William Monroe Trot or Little Engine That Could. Yes. So Random House doesn't yet know that it's the book it's been waiting for. And sometimes the trick is knowing what you don't know, understanding that, okay, I don't know about this, but it is socially and culturally significant, you know. So part of our job is to convince them that this indeed is something that while you don't know it, you should. And you can also manipulate the subject somewhat. You know, you could start, your starting place can be this um, subject without name recognition. And then you can either think about expanding, you know, is it going to be a group biography? Is it going to be a biography of a particular, like a, like a much larger um, uh, world that you're contextualizing, you know, through this person. Um, you could actually think about doing the opposite, which is shrink the subject in some way. Is it just going to be the three years in which they, um, you know, did their most radical work uh, so that we get the most exciting possible story as opposed to a more sort of traditional biography treatment of a longer lifespan? Um, you know, you could really, you can manipulate the subject uh, to find ways to make it as appealing and significant as possible. These are all super helpful suggestions. And I think, um, you know, one approach that I hadn't really thought about before would be basically, you know, that your book isn't necessarily about just this one person, right? It's about this time that they lived in or some context that they have a particular perspective on. So maybe what the reader is learning isn't just about this person, it's about this larger context. Um, I think those, yeah, those are all super helpful. Um, I'm getting questions about the economics of publishing, particularly about advances. And, um, you know, and I guess, you know, if, if those are changing at all, if you're seeing them go up or down. Um, but then also, you know, this question of a university press um, versus a traditional publisher. Um, what kind of advances or sort of range or I don't know, it's very hard to talk about numbers. I know agents don't like to do that, but we always want to, <laughs> we always want to know. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, I actually, I mean, this is really only personal experience, so forgive the anecdotes, um, but um, I haven't seen advances go down. The place I've seen things change pandemic related is in um, the payouts. We don't have to get too bogged down in this, but basically, in advance is frequently paid out in installments um, uh, over time, benchmarked to certain sets of progress. You sign the contract, you deliver the manuscript, the book gets published, and so on. You get certain installments at different periods. Um, and I've seen publishers try to lengthen out those and you know, have more installments, less money each time. Um, uh, that all adds up to a pretty decent advance, but it's spread out over many more years because publishers are just nervous about their cash flow right now. Um, so I so I have seen that. Um, but I, ha I haven't seen advances go down, I'm delighted to say. Um, I would say in terms of the range, um, you know, it's enormously varied. It's a thousand dollars to six million dollars. <laughs> um, that said, you know, most people, um, if you're publishing with a major trade press, it's going to be somewhere in the, you know, mid tens of thousands to the mid six figures. Um, if you're publishing with a university press, it's probably more in the, you know, 2000 to 40 or $50,000 range. That will you guys, will you guys correct my <laughs> estimates if you think they need correction? Um, I don't know that there's, I think you're probably right. I don't know that there is a hard and fast formula. Um, I agree about the benchmarking and I know that, um, so I, I think at least on the horizon, if companies are, some companies are, have probably imposed some kinds of salary caps or asking people to take pay cuts or limiting expense accounts for editors. So perhaps we can look forward to advances, you know, a diminution in advances, but that's not been my experience to date. Um, I'm pleased to say, knock wood. Um, and I think the range that you established is, um, about accurate, you know, you know, up to about 50,000 for a university press book and um, the sky's the limit for others. I think for the future, 
um, there may be more accountability controls installed. Um, and one of the publishing paid me issues, going back to that just for a moment, is the idea of benchmarking success to previous performance. So uh, it's quite likely that you know, there will be more of a standard um, at least examined across the board for all writers, if that's the case. Hard to say, you know, what the, um, it, it, I, I don't have any specific information that there's some secret, you know, CIA table, you know, league table that I can point to and say it's this much or it's that much. It just, it, it's not that sort of world. I'm not withholding information. I just don't think that it's, it's not empirical. It's not predictable. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's safe to say. It's an emotional, subjective business in so many ways, which is, um, you know, part of what makes it problematic and part of what makes it wonderful. <laughs> you know, the, to work on a, much like choosing a subject of a, a book, to edit a book, to publish a book, it, you kind of have to fall in love, especially remember these, if, if this is a popular book that one of us is selling, then, you know, maybe six or seven or 15 people uh, in publishing has fallen in love with this and they have to spend all this time preparing to try and buy the book and they have they have to read it and they have to write memos and they have to find comparable books and they have to talk to their bosses and they have to talk to publicity and sales and marketing and it's a lot I mean I'd go crazy and they lose it most of the time right if, if they're if they're in a competitive uh, situation an auction or anything else like that they you know they lose as much as they win if not more and so they fall in love and then they you know get hurt and then they move on to the next one so it's a it's a crazy emotional non-scientific business but, I, no, go ahead. you're absolutely right and with respect to the financial aspects of it i would say that i have a review in publishers weekly today which is starred it's wonderful it's a biography it's 30 years in the making mm. okay 30 years okay so what kind of money is going to sustain a writer through that keep your day job is the answer if you have one you know because the unforeseen things, the people who fall in love with your book, who are no longer the editor by the time your book is delivered. You know, you're two houses later and something else. It's... Or you just get, you know, I, I, the book that um, I'm having a lot of fun with now, the Eddie Gloud book, Begin Again, about James Baldwin. I mean, you know, that was conceived several, many years ago now. And, and we had, this is an example of craziness in the pandemic. It was supposed to be published in April, pandemic hits. So we move it, we move it to August because August is uh, uh, James Baldwin's birthday. And then um, the, all this, the civil unrest has not shocked our, or maybe for the 20th time, but in the way that it did this time. And, um, and I call up, they had printed books for the April. So that it wasn't about having to print them. The books existed. And so I call up in the first of June or the end of May and I say, we need to move it back. <laughs> right? And we were able to publish the book on June 30th. Because, because you had, you had the books. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because they were not an essential service. Exactly. And yeah. so, I mean, so look at the timing here. I mean, this it's a gorgeous interesting timely examination of a man at a moment um and it's part memoir and part examination of baldwin and it's so current today but it's been in the making for years and it could have been published in april and who knows how it would have done right right, right. no i i you're also a you know subject to the times and other things you know and and i have the book i have not read it but baldwin is one of those subjects who We've done a Baldwin biography many years ago, but that's a subject that begs to be treated in depth. Right. And, right. and enough time has passed such that the richness would come through at this moment, you know? Yes. Absolutely. That will be a wonderful one. I know.
what came up earlier that a lot of biographers who aren't academics, they feel jealous of academics. And I just want to uh, dispel the myth that all academics are supported by their institutions and have tons of time to write books because that has not been my experience at all. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. No, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. But, um, no, no, I think there is that. No, you didn't speak at all. There's definitely that perception out there. And I think it's getting harder and harder uh, for academics to, to write books, particularly these longer in-depth books, because our institutions are being just, their budgets are being slashed and we're having to teach more and there's, you know, my institution doesn't even have sabbaticals anymore, you know, so lots of things. But um, a couple of other questions uh, that relate to our current climate. Um, the submission process. So what, do you, are you seeing changes in that at all? Because um, the, the agent that I mentioned before that I spoke to, he's not my agent, but he, um, he also said it's really hard now to get people's attention simultaneously as you would normally when you send out submissions to lots of different people because everybody's dealing with a different situation. There are lots of people in the industry, for instance, who have small kids at home. Um, and so are you seeing any sort of changes or sort of hiccups in that traditional submission process? I, I'm seeing things be a little bit slower, um, you know, in part because colleagues to get their other, you know, if you send a project to an editor, you send to 15 to 20 editors, some of those people have kids at home, many of them have kids at home, and it is challenging as a parent of a three-year-old, I can sign up for how challenging that is. Um, uh, but then there's also, you know, there's also that um, if you want to talk to your colleagues about something, you can, ju it's just harder to do that in an informal way. You have to, you know, schedule time with them on the phone and you, and if you want to rally the, you know, the room, so to speak, you have to do that virtually. So it just all takes a little bit longer. Um, I found that editors are doing a surprisingly good job of getting that all done. Um, but, um, and, you know, buying books on a pretty timely schedule. Um, but it is, you know, I, I feel certainly forgiving of people when they say, could you give me another day or two? Um, I definitely check in with everyone before I schedule um, the, the, the auction day, um, you know, meaning the day where I solicit offers, um, just because, you know, I want to be respectful of how difficult people's lives are right now. Um, and it, it makes for a smoother process if I do. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely seeing like a little lag, but it's nothing dramatic, su surprisingly, frankly. Yeah, and I guess the question too is about how many, um, how many editors would you typically submit a project to at once? Pretty specific. It would depend upon the project, I think. Do you know what I mean? For me, it would depend upon the project. Um, sometimes it, you know, there are projects that uh, beg to go very wide. Everyone will be interested in this. The author has a platform, is recognized, etc. And then there are things where it's more suitable to a smaller number of people or the author or may have a relationship with someone already or may have encountered someone and have an affinity for that person. So you may expose them to two or three other people just so they can have context for it. Um, the 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 biography that I mentioned previously, someone has asked, is um, the dead are arising. It's a biography of, it's a life of Malcolm X and the author, Pulitzer Prize winner, his name is Les Payne, who in the course of this book project, finding its way to publication, died in March of 2018, right. but will still be published notwithstanding that. So. Okay. Thank you. I was answering um, a question from the side panel. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So um, we've also had uh, a question. I, I'm certainly in this position myself, too. I know many of us are. Um, we're worried about access to archives and when we're going to be able to get there in there again. Um, is this something you talk to your writers about? And our editors, are they going to be patient with us? Things might take a little bit longer. I mean, my son has had this come up with several, several clients is absolutely. Um, I mean, if, unless it's something that has to be published at a certain time because it's news sensitive or something, but, you know, people in publishing are, are generally 
uh, extraordinarily sympathetic and passionate and you know they they love books and they understand the realities as long as they think you're working and not not doing something else instead of uh because there are some archives that you know that, that are are workable online and you know but absolutely yeah, I would also say that I think it's a better practice to ask for the extension before you need it than to wait to the actual deadline or beyond and then try to sort of uh, convince the editor that it's necessary. I think surprises, especially for those projects or long-term projects can be problematic. So it's a great sense for planning so that everybody knows. They know how much money they're sort of putting out, all of that. It helps everyone in the process, the publisher, the author, the agent, everyone ask before you need. It's also why the agent will check in periodically uh, with writers to know sort of what's going on, where are you, how's it going? Yeah, I think sometimes it tends to be seen as too, in, uh, too informal of business. And I, maybe it's the lawyer in me, but I, I do think that extensions and paper trails and things like that um, are very important. Yeah, I would just, I would just, Second, that you want to um, you want to keep in contact with your agent uh, first. If you're if you think you know if you think there's a problem with uh, archive access, and then and then you know by extension with the delivery of the manuscript itself, I would talk to your agent about it and get some advice about how to communicate with your editor um, and set and then and then communicate with your editor and set out a timetable. Um, don't you know? Don't be afraid to have that conversation because it's way better to have it in the early end than on the, the late end. And, 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 you know, I mean, I had a conversation with an author at 11 a.m. this morning about this very thing. So it's happening across the board. It's just not, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's not going to be unusual news to any editors in the next, you know, two and three and four years. Yeah. So this is a question that um, I'm not sure if this is in your wheelhouse or not, but we'll throw it out there. Um, you know, a lot of us are having to do a lot more Zoom meetings. So we're think, I'm thinking of in terms of, you know, doing publicity events. Um, but then also you mentioned, um, you know, Zooming with editors who are interested in your book. I mean, do you have any suggestions for your writers um, or for us about, you know, how to handle these, these pretty new territory for a lot of us? I mean, I've always, been a bit, I've always found great value in having um, my authors meet with people from the potential publishing houses. So I prep them the same way I used to prep them before and in going into meetings in New York, it, you know, in terms of I always talk about going in there with, you know, these little cheat sheets in your head, the five things that you want to make sure you say substantively about your project in every meeting and the five things you want to make sure you talk about in terms of your ability to promote the book and get the word out and help the publisher sell lots of copies. And then the ending where everybody always says, so do you want to know anything about us? The publisher always says, can we tell you anything about us? We've been talking your ear off. And you say, and so I always have them say, well, Gail's told me a lot. Um, and I, I, you know, as I, I get a sense of you all from the questions you've asked and I'm only looking for a partner who helped me make the write the best book possible and sell as many copies as possible and then so I just do that kind of prep and it's the same it's the same zoom prep as well except I did have to tell someone the other day this is the new world of zoom is to not wear cutoffs <laughs> she was she had on very short cutoffs because she never this was during a conversation with me so thank goodness but she had on very short cutoffs because she didn't expect to stand up and she had to do something with her dog and she stood up and she had on really short cutoffs. I would have said the same thing <laughs> to a man, of course, but, uh, and so I said, no cutoffs. So that was, that was a little bit of Zoom etiquette that I am trying to pass along now. <laughs> the same kind of meeting. It's a little bit hard. You know, I, I, I would say I, I had a lot of meetings on one particular project uh, 10 days ago and I noticed that four people on the other side was about the max effectiveness. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm passing this on to my publisher friends because one, one person, one publisher had, you know, eight people. And I suppose, and, and maybe this is true in person as well. 
is you lose the sense. You, okay, you feel that's great. They're really showing me how much they love the project. But when you have eight people on a Zoom asking you questions, it's just really distracting for mm -hmm. your author. And so I really sort of have a, I, I like to think that, we, that it's more effective for the publisher to keep it to a, you know, a, a necessary, uh, passionate and uh, manageable number of people. Yeah, I would say treat treat a Zoom meeting like it's an in-person meeting. Prepare the same way, um, and also try to make the same level of of connection with the editor that you would go for in a in a in-person meeting. I mean, we tell our clients who's who at the meeting, and 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 you know, set them up so they know you know who would be the editor, who's that editor's boss, who's the person that's doing the publicity. I mean, we, we obviously all prep them in such a way. So just treat it like a regular meeting. I don't think I have anything to add. I'm in total agreement and I like to keep it small. Otherwise you yeah. lose something because you forget that we know these people, the author really doesn't, you know, so the publicity person versus the marketing guy, it's, it doesn't really, it kind of goes over their head after a while. You know, they're making their five or three points about their project, so that's sort of it for them. That's very helpful. Thank you all for that. Maybe we should pivot now to some more general questions. And um, um, I wanna to mention too that I keep getting that little box coming up saying that my internet connection is unstable and I live in New Orleans and we are having a lot of thunderstorms come through from that hurricane that's in the Gulf. So, you know, my apologies if I freeze up or something and, you know, feel free to carry on the conversation without me. But um, uh, maybe we should start from the beginning, okay? Because I'm sure we have uh, some biographers with us who don't have agents. And they might be wondering, do I need an agent? Um, you know, I mean, maybe you could talk about when the best time to get an agent is too in the process, right? Do you need to have your proposal done? How, what would you say to uh, somebody who's wondering about getting an agent? Did I freeze up? Maybe. No, no, no. no, no I think we were all having someone else take the <laughs> take the answer. I can I can start if you want. Okay. Um, so okay, maybe I'll tackle when is a good time to get an agent. Um, so you know that's a real judgment call, both on the part of the author and the agent. Um, if you, you know, if, if you have, and, and we should at some point in this conversation talk a little bit about platform, I think, but if you have um, what's called a pretty significant platform, meaning, um, you know, it's sort of an umbrella term in publishing for your set of credentials, the, your publishing history, your media exposure, the contacts you have, basically, you know, what makes you able to write this book and, um, and, and then ultimately promote it and sell copies. Um, so, um, you know, if you have a pretty significant platform, you teach at a, you know, distinguished university and you um, uh, have uh, special access to a set of papers that no one else has seen before and you frequently publish in the Washington Post, I mean, great. You should, if you have your subject, you could essentially approach agents with your subject, uh, maybe a one pager or two pager or something like that to give agents a sense of what it, of what you're, what you're, where you're headed with that project. Um, if like many people, your platform isn't quite that, um, then you probably need to write more of a, you know, a, a real proposal. Um, you don't necessarily need to write a sample chapter, um, which is something that would likely ultimately be part of your package to publishers. But in order to get an agent, I mean, at least for my purposes, I would say that I wouldn't require that, but I would require, you know, a pretty significant proposal that's in polished shape. Um, and that really gives me a sense of, you know, this is a person who knows their stuff and has confidence on the page, is a good writer, um, has their arms around the structure of this book, can convince me that this is a subject that should be a book, and can convince me that they're the person to write it. Um, 
and you know that all, answering all of those properly and smoothly takes um, you know several pages. So I would say, you know, if if the if that platform is is let's say still developing, then um, then you know I would need a much fuller proposal. So it's sort of a calibration for me. Gail, do you have anything to add? Um, well, I, you know, it's, it, I think it's hard to generalize for me. I mean, sometimes I'm talking to somebody and they, that, you know, it's somebody that I know or somebody I know knows and, and they tell me they're writing a biography of X and I say, come in and let's, well, I guess I don't come in anymore, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we begin to talk about it, show them sample proposals and work at the very beginning. I mean. I mean, I think that Catherine's right. It, it just depends on who you are, what your subject is, how well um, you know you know your agent or potential agent. Or, but ultimately, ultimately, and most people hate us as we put them through the uh, grind of writing a terrific, terrific book proposal. Um, they they don't hate us later when they don't have to think about the book all. Along. I mean, the the you know that dozen times in 30 something years that I've actually sold something based on either no proposal or something very short. I've always rude the day and so has the <laughs> author because it, yeah, it's so problematic and it, it can happen, but it's just really, it, it's a problem. So that I love the proposal process. So I probably start earlier than Catherine might, but but that also requires a, a real like falling in love with the, su the subject or the, I tend to fall in love with subjects and clients and all that. And so it just depends, it's, it's totally, totally depends. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I think that um, I get involved or have become involved at various stages through the process. Um, I find that the proposal serves as a really good roadmap and that you really regret not having one. And sometimes also the proposal can be a set of strictures and you find that you have to go back and move yourself away from it. And I would say, as I've noticed just a bit, people have asked about um, to what extent do you participate in that process? And I find that really, it's a great time to bond with your client and to figure out the client's working style and for you and the client to become comfortable with each other and we engage in lots of editing with yeah. clients over proposals. There are people who come who have, you know, one page or two pages and it's just so tight and amazing. But I can tell you that that has happened probably one or two times over my three decades as an agent. I prefer to have much more of a developed plan. And there are also those people who've been approaching me over the years about the same book that has never emerged. <laughs> um, I should say, and I've been told that they've seen many other agents too with the same few pages. And I've always said the same thing, you know, every three years as they emerge, you know, you go back and develop the proposal and then we can have a conversation that means something. So yeah, the proposal is key. Um, do you have any advice for people about finding the right agent and also um, what if this is, what if somebody is is switching genres maybe they write fiction or something else and now they're doing a biography do they need a new agent how important is it that your agent specializes in biography and and, and do you have tips on looking for finding looking for and finding the right agent I think it's a bit like finding a doctor or something, you know, it's sort of, you know, you, it, it, this is a professional relationship and oft times they morph into relationships that are a bit deeper than that. It need not be someone who just does one thing. I think it has to do with your comfort level with them, theirs with you, the input and the exchange between you, the relationship that you can build. Um, and, and those are the critical factors, you know, how comfortably you'll be basically working with this person over a number of years, because the likelihood is that you'll work together for a number of years. Having done a similar book or something else sort of doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's the passion of the agent for the book and the subject for the material. Um, 
and and if that's a good fit then sure go for it i tend to stay away from people that i know well you know i tend not to represent husbands and wives or relatives because it can get a little rasty um you know you have a different relationship with each of them and it's just easier not to have those sort of cross conversations i find but that's just me i i one trick that i've suggested to people is to uh if, if you have no other connections i mean the best way to find an agent surely is to talk to people that you know and, and get because you know it's hard to get to us it's not the easiest thing in the world to get our attention and so you want to come in through people that we know and respect but the other little trick is to I, i'm a sucker for you know one of my favorite book in the world is such and such and uh if you represented that then i know you can um but uh, maybe i don't fall for it this so much anymore but but acknowledgments um you know, authors do take the time to acknowledge their agents often. And, and you can tell by the extent of an acknowledgement. So, if there, um, you know, what that relationship was like and whether there might be that kind of passion that Dave's talking about. So it's a really important relationship. And I mean, it's maybe for most people, their longest standing relationship uh, professionally. Right. I mean, and yeah. I mean, I have people that I'm on book 10 or 11. Me too. And, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's so extraordinary and such a trip. Um, and, you know, people call me and say to me, um, what was I doing in 2012? I can't quite remember. Uh, you know, where did I go on vacation? Right, that kind of thing. But um, so it is a really important, really important match. And so, and I think the right, you know, it's better to have no agent than an agent that you're not confident about or not or you don't have a connection with just keep looking yeah use your connections because the more the more personal the approach the the better chance you have of getting heard right so that kind of leads to my follow-up here which is about getting an author's attention gail or an agent's attention gail mentioned it's difficult do you have tips for people about getting your attention or another agent there's the personal reference. What else? I think the personal reference. I think the, um, uh, let's say if someone wrote and said, you know, uh, I understand that you like art and, uh, you know, that sort of thing, or if they appeal to you in some way that taps into, that shows that they've done their research, or they can tell you a book that's completely unrelated um, someone wrote to me, I can't remember who it was, but they referenced a book that's sort of off, the, that I liked. I happen to, there's a collective, there's a group biography or dual biography of Saint Laurent and uh, Lagerfeld. And it's a gorgeous book. It's, um, it's called, I can't think of what it's called, but it's not my book, but I love the book. And someone came to me and referenced that book. And I thought, oh, that's a wonderful, what, The Beautiful Fall, that's what it's, that's what it's called. But it's a and great, I, great title. It is, and it's it's a fantastic book. But it's um, and I thought I get it. And for the subject, that reference was the perfect thing. And I thought I'd love to do the book. So you find some key, you know, some way of describing yourself in the project as a way, as a gateway to the author, as a gateway to the agent. I mean, basically. I, I'm a sucker for um, someone who has access to something, you know, that hasn't been seen before, or there, there's a, you know, portion that, uh, that, that is entirely new. I just, you know, to be part of contributing something new that way, it really gets me, probably both of you as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you have that kind of thing or can develop it, um, highlight it when you're making an approach to an agent. So when you, let's talk for just a second too about that first approach. So if a, if a writer is writing to you the very first email, um, should it be a short query like an elevator pitch or, or should, it, should they attach their proposal? Um, what's that first email? What should that look like? Well, it shouldn't have the names of every other agent in New York on it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and no dear sir <laughs> right. and, uh, and it shouldn't say things like this is my uh, fiction novel and I mean there, there's a whole list of 
not to have. I don't know, you know, it's funny because back in the day when things were coming in and not by email, you know, you'd say that, that here's exactly what to send and somebody else would be reading everything. Now, you know, it's, it's really quite extraordinary that I can be going through something and, and, and it could just, you know, it just appears. I mean, the, the, the best way for me is a referral, you know, is that so-and-so sent me, right? And then I, I'll, I'll always look at that email. Then I always do follow up with so, if I haven't heard from so-and-so, I'll follow up with so-and-so to see if they really meant to send you. <laughs> Because I have got, well, I remember one time, this was on a, a media related legal matter, but somebody called me and said they were very, very close friends with this client of mine and they needed something done and it had to be done over the weekend. And they said, and the client said that I would do it. And I spent like the whole weekend doing something. And then on the Monday, the, cl the client called and said, God, I hope you haven't heard from, you know, Mr. X yet because uh, just stay away from him. That guy's bad news. I thought, oh my God. So, you know, just, I, I mean, I would start with um, a pitch that has your credentials in it and really has the elevator pitch done as well as possible. And then if you want to show a few more of something more, something shorter, here's an excerpt from the intro, or here's an article I wrote about it, just enough to give me something to go on. I'm very bad at, at, I mean, I need to take in in order to give out the right response. And so I need to take something in. And the big question is if, you're, if your paragraph pitch doesn't get me to open the attachment, then it didn't work. <laughs> so it's hard. It's not, this business is not science. That's what we love about it. But it's also very hard to give you you know, out there, the, you know, do this, do this, do this, because part of that magic is not, you know, I wish I could bottle it for every one of you who's listening to us today, but unfortunately, you know, you can't, you have, you have to make your own magic and, and hope that we appreciate it. I think something about yourself, something about the project and something about your expertise, connection to the project. And I keep going back to passion because I think passion is, contains that sort of seminal element that you were talking about, Catherine, about some special thought, that access to archives or something else that only you know. Somehow or the other, if you can communicate that in the first sort of letter, and it does help to be referred, you know, it, it makes a difference because it means that this person who, whom you already know has vouched for the person who's writing to you, um, and I would be very careful in the letter. Think of it as sort of, you know, an introduction where you're putting your very best self forward. Um, I often get letters addressed to dear Marie Brown, dear Gail Ross, you know, and you just sort of think, what, what were you thinking? You know, like, so yeah. And sometimes if it doesn't go through or you don't get an immediate response, it might very well be that the person did not receive the letter. Uh, did not receive the communication because that has happened to me as well. Um, so I would say circle back, you know, and it, in times you find out that it might have gone into the spam filter or something else happened, but um, be a little bit persistent, use your contacts and put your best self out there. Well, and the other thing to do for sure is to do the thing you're doing today, which is uh, attend conferences like this or, or things like this, because now you you all each have an entree to the three of us now because we talk to you through um, the bio group. So take advantage of that kind of stuff too, especially now it's easier to take mm -hmm. advantage of, th of things like that online all the time. And mention it in your note. You know, yeah. I, oh, I heard sure. you at the bio panel, that, 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 you know, um, make that connection. Right, so getting back to just quickly, um, because I know I've had this experience, you write to an agent, you never hear back. Um, and then you wonder, when is it okay to follow up? So maybe two weeks, if you haven't heard anything follow up or I've, I've seen different. Yeah, I would say, online, to, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if it's just like a short email with a couple pages of attachment, you're not asking really a lot, you know, agents get a lot of volume. That's sort of the background to why we're so careful um, about 
what we read, we, we get a lot of those kinds of approaches, but you know, you're not, if you're not asking someone to read a 300 page manuscript, you know, a week or 10 days, two weeks, um, you could check in. You could even probably, I mean, in my mind, if someone wants to check in even a second time, I'm okay with that. I would say after that, it's probably not going to happen. And don't call. Yeah. 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 No, no, don't call. Um, okay. So let's move on to the proposal because once you approach somebody, you want to have a pretty good proposal in hand, as we talked about, something to show them that's more developed. And I think we've had some questions about, you know, what should a proposal, what are the key elements and should it have a sample chapter? Sure, I think I talked about this initially, so I'll, I'll, I'll start it off and we can refine from there. Um, I, so I, I sort of go with two different proposal models um, and, uh, you know, really in my mind, the author could pick either one. Um, uh, it, the first one is the sort of more standard model. It's um, an overview, you know, it's the, it's the couple of pages of pitch material. It's what's the big idea, you know, what's the significance, um, uh, why is this urgent, relevant to the contemporary reader? Um, why am I the person to write it? Not so much in the like author biography, this is where I went to school kind of way, but more, you know, what is my connection to this material? Um, just that, you know, it's, it's, it's the pitch, be, be persuasive. It's not summary, it's persuasion. Um, and then, uh, and then I would say, um, and really, you know, try to have that um, overview really like land at the end in a big way, get me jumping out of my seat wanting to sign this person, read this book. Um, and then um, and then a chapter outline. Um, and the chapter outline can be of varying lengths. Um, you know, some people like a paragraph or two, you know, description of each chapter. Um, some people prefer to do, you know, multiple pages. Um, I'm actually okay with either as long as it's good. Um, and the idea behind the um, chapter outline is to is to demonstrate that you have your arms around the, the structure of the book, that you have a sense of organization, that it is a book, it's not an article, you know, that it has like real meat on the bones. Um, and that and that there's a momentum to it in some fashion, you know, with biography, it's nice because you often can be fairly chronological, um, though, you know, not always. So, um, so, you know, get, give the agent a sense of how the book is going to progress, you know, from chapter to chapter, building upon itself, um, that there's a, there's an energy to move, moving forward through the book. Um, so the chapter outline should, you know, do all of that. Um, uh, and then, um, and then a sample chapter. Um, and that's, you know, it doesn't have to be chapter one, doesn't have to be, certainly doesn't have to be the introduction. Um, I would say, you know, picking a very late chapter as your sample chapter is probably not a great idea um, because you have to write it as, you know, assuming a lot of knowledge from the reader having read the earlier chapters. I mean, it's, it's like a, that's a messy proposition. Um, so I would say, you know, pick one of the early chapters that doesn't need to be the first one. Um, in fact, pick one where you already have a lot of research, especially if the archives are going to be closed for a couple more months. Um, and, um, and pick something that is one of your, you know, it's one of your really exciting chapters. It has some of the most provocative material, some of your best argumentation, maybe some of your um, best, like really detailed research so we can get a sense of the paint on the walls, so to speak. Um, you know, however you make that decision, it's fine, but, um, but pick something where you could really write a a vivid, provocative, compelling chapter. Um, and that should be, you know, pretty standard length chapter in my mind, somewhere between, you know, two and 6,000 words. Um, and then there's, you know, some ancillary material. Usually there's an author biography. Um, my colleagues and I have gotten in the habit recently, I'd be curious to hear um, Gail and Faith's uh, opinion about this, but we've gotten in the habit recently of having very personal author biographies. Um, they're all uh, in the I voice um, and they often, you know, start with how you, the author, came to the subject um, uh, and what your sort of like emotional connection is to the subject. That works better with some people's material than others, but, but it has, um, it has really kind of like loosened up the author biography and made it not a CV, but a sort of statement of purpose in a sense. Um, and I have, um, I've come to really like those. I think they're more fun to read for the editor, which is always a plus. Um, and then, um, and then some marketing and promotional material. Uh, and that can be, you know, anything from a list of recent 
pieces you've written. If you're a journalist or you write a lot of op-eds, um, it can be, you know, lots of the organizations that you would uh, imagine would be interested in this book, um, course adoptions, uh, courses that would make sense for this book. Um, the people you know um, in the bio group who would write an endorsement for you. It's kind of a um, grab bag, but it's, you know, um, and, and often agents can be helpful in sort of organizing that with you. But what you want to do is put everything in there you can possibly think of that would be um, promotional avenues for the book. And those are, that's, those are the main components. And that's one, um, that's one uh, format and the one I use really the most. And the other is, is a sort of simpler, um, rather than breaking it up into overview, chapter outline, and sample chapter, it's just a long sort of comp composite of the book. Um, so it's essentially like a description of the book that's often, you know, 30, 35 pages um, that just like reads very smoothly, almost like a, a condensed version of the book. I think those are a little harder to do. Um, and you really, you often need to have done a lot of research on the whole book to write those. Um, but, um, but they work for some people sometimes. So I mentioned that as an option. I would agree with you. I, 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 it depends on the subject matter and it has to be sort of a very smooth operator who can pull off the sort of one piece summary beginning to end kind of arc of the book. Um, that's the experienced biographer who's written three or four previous volumes and the subject is just so, um, fresh at hand that they can do it that way. I think that the overview um, about the author sample chapter approach um, is much easier to master. And I think that people are used to seeing it that way. I would agree with you. And of late, we have begun to use um, that personal voice, the I, first person voice in about the author, because I think it connects the author with the material. It shows that you have a personal connection to it and it shows to your investment in it. I just said that to someone this morning before I got on this call that I preferred not talking about yourself in the third person, you know. I've always I, called it, I've always called it, why am I writing this book? And oh, then, that's nice. I like that. Yeah, you guys can steal that. That's fine. <laughs> Thank um, you. We'll, we'll, we'll put your name at the bottom of that. <laughs> and I'm really sorry, but I, I thought I have a 2.30 uh, big meeting right. on this yeah. Zoom, so I, I really have to go. Yeah, on. we know that you need to go. And Gail, great to see you. And yeah. all of your time is very valuable, so I just want to... I just want to thank you all so much. This has been super helpful for me and I'm sure it has been for others. Um, and thank you again. I can't, I really can't thank you enough. So thanks to everyone who came and we'll, we might have to do a part two at some time because I'm sure we could talk for another hour more. So thank you all. Thank you for Bye everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Anne for, for managing us. <laughs> oh, thank you. This was wonderful. Great just to meet you. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.